Linda was licensed in the summer of 2017 as a solo agent here in Eugene Springfield. She's been in the top 20% of production for Keller Williams Eugene Springfield and has served on the culture committee since joining Keller Williams. She's one of our staple members and believes the KW culture is one of our strongest assets. She's a big proponent of being a lifelong learner. She's participated in Bold twice and she rarely misses a opportunity for learning even when it's in Portland. When special trainings or speakers are brought in, you can count on her being there. So she's a really great person to be learning from. She started her career going through the PC program. So she has been where you have, are um, and has con just continued to grow and flourish from there. So I will let her take it away. All right. So don't go too far till I share my screen here. Make sure that I'm... I won't. <laughs> All right. Look at you, you got it. All right, dear, thanks a lot. You're welcome. All right, so, well, welcome everyone. I'm really happy to be with you today. And I can't say enough about my experience being with Keller Williams. I have not interviewed with any other agency, nor have I uh, worked for any other. I came here uh, basically because of their training program. And I think no matter what age you are that you start into real estate, this is an ever-changing, ever-evolving uh, business. And yes, you can have tons of transactions and or you can have minimal amount of transactions. And after seven years of being in it, I am still learning new things. So it's, it's a much more complex business than you would think when you start it, but it's also interesting that you can get started so soon with just having had your training and then having the backup, like Mara was saying, with that PC program. Because I never once had to deal with someone who said, how many houses have you sold? They never said, have you had any, I mean, is this your first transaction? None of that ever came about. So have no fear. You have a great team behind you. There's lots of Keller agents out there that will help you. And just raise your hand if you need help. So don't ever feel like you're alone in this journey, even if you are a solo agent. I've been solo and I plan to stay solo. And it's uh, it's fun and exciting and and uh, just uh, get out there and make a mess. That's, that's my motto. So uh, let's just see if I can bumble my way through this slide presentation. I'm not very good at these slides. I, I have a tendency, because I believe that you all can read the handouts that you have, that you know how to read. So I have a tendency to tell more stories. I use the um, outline that we have uh, more for a, a guide. And then I tell you of some of my experiences that I've had along the way. I'm a firm believer that, that uh, stories sell. And that every time that you can have a story that you can tell about something, it's much better than just rote memory and and uh, reading things. So uh, let's just dive right in here and see what they have to say for us. So course overview. So we'll just uh, go through all of these. There's um, there's no shortage of uh, topics here for us to cover. Our belief system, and most of you, uh, we used to start out all of our KW meetings, like our all partners meetings with this belief system. And it's sort of like the golden rule. Um, I just truly believe that all, none of these are, are bad things. They can only help you. And you know, the funny thing about um, the more that we repeat this belief system, and that was one of the advantages that I felt when we would repeat this at the all partners meeting each time once a month when we were together, is that we can use these to repeat when we're making contact with other people. And um, it's interesting how sometimes you're just struggling for the words, but when you're trying to sell yourself and, and the product that you have as a realtor, any one of these at times will you'll find a niche for them to work into your uh, sales pitch. Uh, for example, um, results through people. That can mean having a transaction coordinator. That can mean having Tom Dye, our principal broker here in the Eugene branch. I know that some of you are from other branches, but um, you can reach out to the principal broker. Um, 
that there Tom has helped me in all kinds of uh, issues which could have been could have evolved into legal issues and he also his expertise helps me to understand what our parameters are so um, the the people that you surround yourself with um, also has makes a difference on what kind of success that you can have so I, I think it's this belief system if you just read through it even if you just printed it off and set it to yourself every morning when you get up and start your business win win or no deal and and oftentimes these things come in when, for example, let's just say that you were giving an open house and uh, somebody came through and it looks like they were a good prospect, but they had um, they had an agent and then you tried to coerce them into um, doing some business with you. That is not a that's not a win win. Uh, and it's not the ethical thing to do. And it's actually can cost you some some. Um, big trouble in your business but those kind of things do happen um and and uh, just knowing how to conduct yourself in the in the business world uh in that regard will will save you a lot of grief so we're going to jump right in here um i'm going to go on to and you'll just have to figure out what page i i'm at it says 12 on mine but i don't know if that's 12 for you uh, the quote here says, I like to think of sales as the ability to gracefully persuade, not manipulate a person or persons into a win-win situation. It's a pretty good quote. Okay. All right. Now, I will see if I can find my own page here where I'm supposed to have something brilliant to say. So don't mind me as I'm flipping pages here to figure out where I'm supposed to be. They give me some scripts to say and that sort of thing and get me started. And so okay, so I'm going to move this over here so I can see what I'm trying to read. All right, so um it says for me to explain the details of this offer process as outlined. So when a buyer makes an offer, uh, real estate is always a, a, a negotiation in multiple parts. I like to think of it as at least four parts that we have to negotiate. We negotiate when we're trying to make an offer to a seller. If you're in the seller position, you're after that, you're negotiating for repairs. Same with the buyer. I mean, that's their step number two after they've made their earnest money deposit and then uh you negotiate all the way along you negotiate if the appraisal doesn't come in at value what happens next and so there's lots of uh negotiation throughout this entire offering process so um it says oh dear, oh dear. Be sure to explain that all this process is one that has all the parties excited and often emotional. Also be clear that the process is often a loop and it is not linear. Uh, and just speaking to the emotional side of your, of your buyers and sellers, I find that sometimes we can overhype our own uh, clients by, by pointing out too much dread and be aware that this might happen or that might happen. And sometimes you can actually talk yourself out of business. So um, it's very important to keep your own emotional level in check. It says, what emotions do um, buyers and sellers at this stage of the process have? So anybody that wants to jump in can answer that question. So what would you think that when they're getting ready to make the offer, what do you think that some of their emotions would be? Well, for certain, anxiety is going to be one of them. They, everybody is anxious about it. They're excited. Uh, they're also impatient. Uh, and it's just flat out nerve wracking. Um, and it doesn't, sellers are the same way, but buyers, in, particularly in a market where we don't have an overabundance of inventory, um, the buyers particularly have a lot of um, 
in trepidation and it's uh, even more so if they've made multiple offers and not succeeded. Mm -hmm. You know, I suppose the, the, the emotion would be when they make an offer, whether or not they have, they, they've over offered or they've under offered, in which case they would not be able to get the, you know, the offer would not be competitive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and so part of that is is an agent's agent's job to kind of help set the expectations for your buyers. Um, if and so, we'll get to kind of some of these ins and outs steps about what you do and the contact that you have with a, a listing agent because that can really help to calm your buyer and so that they have a clear path of what we're expecting. And sometimes we can even get numbers out of those listing agents of what the other competition is or if they have zero. So um, that's part of the buyer's agent's job. So um, it's that our job is to remain professional and put together. It's not our purchase, nor is it our sale. And we don't want to get too emotional. We serve them by being calm, reassuring, in control, and most importantly, by communicating everything to our clients in a timely matter. manner. So um, and it says, what are the rules for how quickly you must provide them with contracts and other documents? Uh, so uh, I think that this uh, conversation gets a little bit vague here. Um, so let's just assume that first we're going to talk about a buyer making an offer. So when that happens, um, did somebody have a question? Um, so, uh, when we first start out with our clients, I ask them first of all if they're uh, if they have ever used DocuSign before and if they're comfortable with using it. I have had buyers and sellers both that I have had to print out the full contracts and have them sign those. I personally um, don't like doing that. It's very easy for us as agents to also miss a place where they're supposed to sign. Whereas if you send it through a DocuSign, uh, and I have a transaction coordinator in our Eugene office. I use Angela. She's right there in the office. And uh, so she, she does contract after contract after contract. And so she's very good at it. And when she sets that up, DocuSign automatically sends the buyer to the next place where they're either putting an initial or signing. And the... The one thing that I would say in terms of your, your buyers and your sellers, when they're doing these DocuSign contracts, I make sure that before I have sent this out, that I have covered every single point on there that's important because for the mass, mass amount or vast majority of the clients, whether it's a buyer or a seller, they do not read word for word through that. I would say less than 25% of them will read the details of that contract, which is pretty astonishing considering that they might be spending a half a million dollars. Um, so remind them that you are setting up your buyer and seller guides in your KW app, which is a great way to keep clients in the know on the process from beginning to end. Um, I actually don't use that KW app for that. Um, it might be a good idea to do it. However, I don't. It says, remember to put all your offers in opportunities in command. And again, um, Angela, who's my transaction coordinator, does that for me. And if you um, consider hiring a transaction coordinator, just know that they have to be affiliated with KW. You can't hire somebody on the outside that isn't within KW because they will not let them um, have access to command. Okay. All right. So they're already wanting um, uh, ahas. I think I better back up here to this previous um, slide. So um, going through these steps here, when the buyer makes the offer to the seller, 
if the seller and this is when you go in before you ever write this offer and i do make sure that i do this before i go and show the house but i go back into the rmls listing and make sure that they that the listing agent hasn't added any more private remarks and as i i do well the last couple of years i've done about 70 percent of my business has been listings um uh, Prior to the last couple of years, I was probably 50-50 with buyers and sellers, maybe even leaning heavier to buyers. So I have done, I've had, I'm kind of an equal opportunity um, agent. I've had about probably overall in my seven years, I've probably had a 50-50 split between the buyers and the, the sellers. Um, as a listing agent, I'm very detailed in terms of what I put on uh, in those private remarks. Anything that I think might help get that listing sold or help that buyer's agent um, so that they have all the information. It just cuts down on phone calls and texts to you. Not that that's a bad thing, but um, it just saves time and makes for clarity. Um, so when I'm going to show the property, I look at the RMLS, make sure that they, if they've set a new date or a time, like for one thing, some people, last year when the market was so hot, they, uh, we would list a property and we would give it maybe um, by the third day that we wanted all offers in by a certain time frame. And you'll find that a lot of the listing agents will list on Thursdays. So that gives agents time on Thursday and Friday to show the property. And then on Saturday and Sunday, if you wanna hold an open house, you can have it for like two hours each day. Um, and one of the beauty parts about having an open house is that statistically, they say that every listing that you have when you that you should generate one to two more listings. I, I wish I could say that that has been true for me. It has. But um, if, this is a little bit different time frame where we've been able to have more open houses than it was last year when because sometimes last year our property was selling within 36 hours or less. And um, sometimes we'd have 10 or 12 offers. And really it was, there was not a lot of point in dragging it out. Yes, it would be nice to have held the open houses and to be able to springboard off that. But sometimes your deadlines were running out on these offers and you have to make a decision on what's the best thing for your seller. It's not your seller could care less if you're going to get another bump in getting another um, uh, house to sell or another buyer client. That's not what the from the seller's perspective, that's not what it's about. They want if they know that they have a boatload of offers, they want to look at them and and get a decision made. So um, so when you the. The important from the buyer's perspective. Uh, when you make this offer, you want to make, before you write it, you want to call the listing agent and ask them uh, what what is it that would make your offer most appealing to their seller. And sometimes it's it may be that they need three days after close to occupy the house. Uh, they may need three weeks after close to occupy the house. And I had that happen last year. Uh, this lady, the seller, her husband was in the ICU unit and she simply could not, she was in her early 80s and she just could not get everything done fast enough. And so uh, we got a really wonderful, uh, like, it was like $106,000 over the asking price and they gave her three weeks to stay in. So for free. So uh, but knowing what the, the seller wants and that you can then craft your offer to that, um, it, that's part of the key to success being a buyer's agent. Uh, and I would say probably the second thing that is the most important in, from a buyer agent perspective is uh, talk to that sell, listing agent more than once. So once you've like shown the house, you're going to talk to them and just find out if there's anything specific that you should know. Um, and before you show it, uh, you want to ask that listing agent, do you have any offers in hand as of yet? And so if they say that you have one offer already, 
then you're going to be saying to your buyer, um, this is a new listing. They've already got one offer. So in order to buy this property, um, you're going to have to offer more money than the listing price. And oftentimes they don't like to hear that, but they might as well know it up front because it's the reality. And one thing that um, I have said to my my clients, you know, in, in the beginning, you're trying to build rapport and everything. But they also have to understand that you're there for their best interest and that you're not there to, to blow smoke and to make them feel good. You're there to be honest and to get them in the house that they want but you're not there to add fluff to this. You have to be very factual, very informed, and that's the key to your success. You just can't, you know, they have to have a clear picture about what's happening. So, so contact number one with that listing agent is to find out if they have any offers on the table, set your appointment to go show it. Some of them may have you set it up in showing time. I, I, tell them not to use showing time because I want them to either text me or call me so that I can have some communication with that buyer's agent. Um, so then after you show the property and you want to, and you know that you're going to make an offer, then I call that listing agent and I said, my buyers are interested and we're, I'm going back to the office. We'll be making a, an offer. Do you have any further offers that other than this first one? We're just going by this saying that they had one offer on the table. And if she says, yes, I have um, two offers in hand, then um, go back and say, well, in the beginning, you won't, you wouldn't ask this question. So only on the second call, when you know that you're going to make an offer, would you ask them what's the most important thing to the seller and how can I make my um, offer the most appealing. Um, so then you go back, you you have a discussion with your buyer, you write the offer, and um, and I won't get into escalation clauses, but those are uh, ways that you can help uh, protect your client to um, set a comfort level for them. And there's a lot of uh, debate back and forth about it. I've used them very successfully. And uh, sometimes people will say, "Let's an escalation clause, for example, let's just say we had a house at 300,000 and they have two offers on the table and your clients are, are uh, qualified to buy up to 350. But let's just say that they feel comfortable offering three and a quarter. So then you write an offer that uh, you'll pay the three hundred thousand, and and if you already have two offers on the table, I would just pay them three ten to begin with. I wouldn't use the three hundred. I would jump those two people because honestly, you you'll be surprised at how many agents can't do the calculation for an escalation clause, and it's not difficult. But I'm telling you, they're out there. So. Um, so again, this is an the house that's listed at three hundred thousand. They have two offers, and so my buyer is going to say, "Okay, I'll pay you three ten, and then you're going to write an escalation clause. That's a separate addendum, and you will pay up to three twenty five, and that you will pay twenty five hundred. You have to when you do an escalation clause, you have to set an amount." on how much more that you will pay than the next best offer. So let's just say in theory that the first person offered 305, the second person offered 310, you're offering 310, but we'll go up to three, paying $2,500 over that best price. So the best price was 310 and you are offering $2,500 over. So then your purchase price would be 312,500. Now there are people that will say, well, if you say that you'll pay up to 325, then um, why shouldn't the seller just come back and, and counter you to three and a quarter and because you've shown your hand? Well, if your client is comfortable with paying that three and a quarter and that seller comes back and counter counter offers you at three and a quarter and they're comfortable with that, 
there's no reason why you can't do that. I have yet to have one seller come back and counter me at my highest escalation clause number. And I'm sure they're out there, but I haven't had it happen to me. So, um, uh, and so, so sometimes you can get a seller to, the seller will come back and counter the offer that you have. And I'll just give you an example on a current listing that I have. I have a country property, it's 10 acres. It's got an 1,840 square foot house. I started out at 750 and, and country properties don't sell as fast. Sometimes they'll sell in a few days. Um, lots of reasons why, but um, you're just looking at a much smaller number of people that want to have a 10 acre piece of property in the country. So this is out by Shadow Hills Country Club, which is a nice area in Eugene. And it's on 10 acres and the house was built in 1960. Uh, just a ranch style house and it's got some outbuildings on it that um, it's got a barn, a hay barn and, and a shop, but the shop has a dirt floor, no garage. You could park a car, several cars in the, the shop. It's right beside the house. But anyway, so I was at 750. I went down um, after the first month, I reduced the price 51,000 to 699. And I got an offer for 650. So, uh, and it's in a trust. So we went back and we countered this 650 price. We countered and said we would uh, sell it for 689. So we came down 10,000 and they, they weren't able to do it. So we, then everything fell out and we had no contract and the property is still for sale. So that is, that's what a counter looks like. In a more reasonable thing, if you had a situation, maybe the uh, uh, sometimes when they put in their contract that there's certain things that they want, um, you can. It, it's it maybe it's um, maybe they're asking for something. Let's just say that in this case of my country property, maybe they're asking for the tractor and the riding lawnmower to be thrown in for zero cost. And we could counter them back um, with the price that they want and, and that sort of thing. But we don't wanna throw in that tractor and the riding lawnmower for free. So those are just, yeah, there's all kinds of things that you can counter back. And as long as you're countering back and forth between clients, um, you're still in activity with them and you're still talking and as long as you're within the time frames that you have set, um, you're golden, and and you've got to you have to to get to the uh, end of and get to closing date. You have to have a willing buyer and a willing seller all the way along. But you learn your negotiation skills, and those things sometimes you need help from uh, your coach. But um, real estate can be a lot of negotiation. So if they accept your offer, then you begin the process. Um, uh, the seller side, they'll open up escrow. Your client has three days to take their earnest money in. And uh, and then 10 days, business days. So that'd be Monday through Friday to have an inspection done. And um, at this point, right now, we're just talking about, so we got the offer accepted and it says here begins the contract to close process, which was I was just talking about. Now, if somebody, re if a seller rejects the offer, um, I often, uh, I sometimes I just let the these offers expire. They have a date and a time on them, and I just let there. Um, yes, you can reject them, and you have that means that you have to send them to your your buyer and um, have them sign or a seller and have them sign this rejected offer or if the buyer is going to reject it. I just, I just skip that process and I just let it um, expire and I don't send it back to those buyers and sellers. That's up to you. And- I got, I got a question. Sure. On your uh, price reduction. Uh-huh. Do you have a specific timeline for that? You mentioned a month, but is it? Do you have a specific timeline, say for 
uh, a country property or a certain price versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, inner, inner uh, city property or uh, a lower or higher price? Well, there's lots of different ways to approach a price reduction. If it's a city property, if you're if it's been on the market for a week and you're getting little to no showings, then uh, a week or 10 days is a maximum that I would have it on before I'd probably do a price reduction. And there, you know, and that can be a 5% reduction. Uh, and those are conversations that you want to have with your seller before you ever get started about, um, uh, you know, if, if particularly if your sellers have insisted on a price that didn't comp out, I make sure that I have that conversation with them. And, and it, yeah, five to 10% is going to be the number. And the, and the reason that you have a number like that, like a thousand dollars doesn't cut it. It won't do anything for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. searches are all based on, um, on algorithms. And in order to get more eyes on your property, you have to have a, enough of a reduction for it to set up new uh, search priorities for the people that are out there looking and for it to kind of reset the algorithm. And what, go ahead. what about, yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask on your country property, you, you waited a month and I'm oh, just yeah. curious about your thinking behind yeah. that process. Go ahead. Well, because, well, and I probably, if I, if I had been, if the property had been shown like every week, somebody was showing it, um, then I would, I probably may, may even have waited a little bit longer, but I had three showings the first day that it hit the market and I didn't have any more showings for that 30 days. So the activity level dictated when to come down. And a lot of times buyers, when they're out there searching, they search, they set their price parameters in increments of 25,000. So like 600,000, six and a quarter, 650, 675, 700. So um, I got it down just under, uh, you know, I jumped it down to, to price. 699, yeah. Yeah. What, and what, but, what was your thought process behind that instead of going right at 700 to catch everybody looking at seven, just to make sure you weren't catching people that look were looking from a little bit higher? It didn't, it was just more just the way that it looked, you know, 699 versus 700,000. Okay. Yeah. I might keep my numbers fairly even, but on this particular one, I just wanted to make sure that I got it under the 700 and it just looked better than 750. Yeah. Maybe as humans, we're kind of semi-trained by like grocery shopping too, that like you're getting a deal because of that 99. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that's true, but yeah. Do anything tricky. I don't do like six six ninety nine five hundred. It's like why bother? Yeah. I don't do. And somebody said, "Well, why don't we just do an odd number?" No. <laughs> Thanks for addressing that pricing. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. It's like I had there. There was a an age on a property that was a cottage growth property, and it was one that I had gone and looked at. Uh, when I was first starting in real estate. And so I put it on the watch list on the RMLS. There's that little button that you can just click to watch it. And so every time anything gets changed on that listing, you'll get a notification from RMLS or whatever uh, MLS system you're in. And um, so this agent, every week, he would reduce the price by $100. And I'm like, are you nuts? <laughs> I don't know if he ever sold that property. But it was pretty crazy. All right. So let's go on to the ahas. So does anybody want to chime in on anything you might have learned from that little segment? Whoops. Ahas. Or questions. Doesn't matter. Doesn't have to be my br brilliant expertise. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> The question that I have, um, when you do an escalation clause uh, and you set your ceiling, uh, like you were saying, 
and then they, if they come back and accept your ceiling, how how can you prove that they are not? If they've just taken your ceiling, that you you could okay. have gone lower. Yeah. So you're talking about the escalation clause? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there in the verbiage for the escalation clause, it requires the listing agent to block out the name of the buyer but to give you the page of the listing contract that shows what they paid for the property or what their what their author is so you have they have to provide proof to you before they before you sign your um your uh because there will be another addendum that will restate the price. So uh -huh. if you had said you'd go up to three and a quarter and, and your escalation price got you to, say, 315. Then, right. Yeah, before you, there will be an addendum that will come that will state the new price. And then at the same time, they're going to provide proof to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um, if when this is over, if you want, um, I can email you out the verbiage for the escalation clause that I use. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that, um, my email address is Linda, L-I-N-D-A dot read, R-E-E-D at K-W dot com. Okay. Okay. No, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Corey? When uh, when do you know um, when to keep negotiating and when do you know uh, just to say, you know what, this ain't going to work? Like, like, for instance, when you're talking about how you went down to 689 on the country property, uh -huh. you say, you know, with that guy, you know what, this, this isn't going to work as opposed to saying, well, let's try six. I don't know, 75 or 680 or 679 or whatever. What's what in your head is the what's the trigger, I guess, is the way to say it, or the what okay. makes you figure out the difference between those two? Well, um, for starters, the the sellers did not want to go below the 689. And in the meantime, be after I um after I discussed with the sellers and the, and we had sent off our counter offer then the listing or the buyer's agent called me and said um he sent it to his client but they came back and said we just can't do it where you know they it was a couple and they had kids and <clears throat> they were and they were actually first time home buyers which that's a pretty big hump to bite off for a, a first time home buyer and they just didn't want to put themselves in that kind of financial jeopardy. So he told me that that was all that they had, that they couldn't do anymore. And so it just didn't go anywhere. They didn't respond. Or no, he did get them to sign the rejection. I take that back. But um, now here's the interesting thing. We still have that property for sale. And the um, and it's an estate. And the <clears throat> the people that are inheriting the property, they live out of state. And so they have to decide if we want to go back and because this, this has been like mm, probably three weeks now. And we haven't had, uh, we've had some showings, but we haven't had any more offers. And now the property's been on the market for, well, we first listed March, the end of March. And there's other properties, other 10 acre properties that are within a five mile radius of this property that are listed like at 850. And they do have like their outbuildings, their barns for and everything are probably in better condition than the barns on this property. But uh, but we're talking $200,000 difference. And so you would think that if it was uh if we were in the ballpark and all of that, that with a low inventory and all of that, that we would see more activity. And we just haven't. So that's just one of those conversations now. It's up to these people in that 
that are the recipients of the trust, the trust has an executor and uh, the executors had to do a lot of hands-on work with this and everything. So then they just have to decide at, you know, at what point, how much longer do they want to keep uh, spending their uh, time? They go out and water every day and, and, uh, and they've got somebody that comes and mows and everything else. So it's, you know, we, that may be our best offer. And sometimes uh, you just have to say the market is giving us our answer. And if you have, if time is of no issue and, but price is, uh, the, the real killer to a property that's been on the market for a while, oftentimes is days on market is the enemy of your listing. So that's why I say, as a matter of fact, that if, when we were first listing this, the executor's husband thought, well, that this would be, be good if we just marketed it at eight and a quarter. And we came out at 750. And you can see what eight and a quarter would have done, you know, and because it was just slightly under the the two 850 properties that were nearby. But I said, look, those properties haven't sold. They still haven't sold. So, you know, you can't, sometimes you just have to know, know uh, where your stats are and everything. And you have to know what else is out there, what the competition is and say, look, these guys aren't selling either. And they're more money. Slightly better property for, you know, in some ways because of their outbuildings. But anyway, yeah, you have to know, you kind of have to know your stats too and how to advise people. And in this point, it, at this particular time, I've gone back to them and said, okay, um, you know, we've now gone for a couple of weeks with no showing. So, you know, maybe we need to look at this a little bit more closely. And sometimes, the, the more that the time lapses for sellers, particularly in this case where it's an inheritance, then, then they all of a sudden start to realize, well, maybe we just were dreaming too big. And I'm not, I'm not convinced that the property's not worth the, the price that we have it at. I think it is. Uh, even though we countered that other uh, uh, buyer 10,000 under what we have it listed at, I have not reduced the price to that. I just left it there for now. So, and that I could do that. Uh, I'm not convinced that 10,000 would make a difference. You know, agents know how to counter. So, um, but it, it certainly made a difference. We doubled the amount of uh, buyers that looked at the house when we reduced it to 51,000. So that kind of changed everything, but still hasn't got the property sold. And then on the other hand, I just sold a, an upper unit condo and it sold, you know, like in a nanosecond. So <laughs> it just depends on what you, you know, what property you have these days. Okay, so this is kind of what we already talked about, preparing it, writing it, waiting for- So, so I, I have one more question. So when faced with such a situation and if it goes on for much longer, what would be your next option? Is it to take it out of the market and relist it? What no. would be the best? No, no. Any agent can go online and look at the history. Even Zillow will tell you the history of a property. There is no advantage advantage to taking it off and then relisting it. None. Uh, no, they're that they're just it doesn't get you anything. Not with the internet. There's just too much information that everything that's public information. No, I, I if. If they, you know, this one, the the offer at six fifty, they said come back to us. They had been looking for a while for the property. Doesn't mean they haven't found anything in the last couple of weeks because stranger things have happened. But if we don't get any activity, then we'll we're going to start to we'll have to look at doing another price reduction. But there were enough um, showings that were coming through that. Um, I wasn't getting too concerned about doing a price reduction, but now I'm thinking it's time to make a move. You know, see their price reduction or go back and try to accept this 650 offer. So, 
And sometimes it depends on the piece of property you have. Um, in this particular case, there's there's things that, for example, it has vinyl siding on it. I don't know what the condition of the original siding is. It's underneath the vinyl siding. There's only been one of the buyers out of all of them that have commented on the siding, but that was one of the last um, buyers that took a, a look at the property. They said, well, that the agent said that they were concerned about the siding. Well, you know, when you stand back and you look at it, um, there's nothing wrong with the siding, but, and if you were, it, as a seller, if we were to go in and replace it with wood siding, and make it look real attractive on the exterior. And it, it looks nice. I mean, if you wanna look at the property, you can, it's 30558 Compton, C-O-M-P-T-O-N, Compton Lane in Junction City. Um, it looks fine from the outside, but it would cost between 20 and 25,000 to put wood siding on that house. And so is it, does it make sense to spend that kind of money to try and get it sold? I don't think so. So, um, you know, there's always things that you can do, but is it is it smart money spent? So probably not. Okay. And then as usual, I've probably got way ahead of myself here in, in talking. So we'll just quickly go through this, prepare to write an offer. A lot of these things I've already talked about, but you find out if it's, it, look at that R, RMLS listing and then call the agent. So build this rapport with the listing agent. And I'll tell you the people that keep in the most contact with me, they're the ones that are in the top of my mind awareness. And I do not consider that they're bugging me. I had one little agent and she was so interesting. Um, young gal and she, um, not that there's anything wrong with that, and she uh, she made me an offer on a property that I had last year, and she started texting me, and it just so happened that I happened to be, and she was texting me well into the night, but um, and she was pretty funny, and and but we had some commonalities because my background is that I was a wholesale lumber trader for years, and so she came from a logging family. But um, she made me this offer. It was just barely above the list price. And uh, she wasn't the first one to give me an offer. She's like the second or third. And this property got huge activity. And it was a house that needed updating. It was very well maintained, but it was just outdated. Like the, the master bathroom or bedroom had pale pink carpeting. And yeah, it was, it was amazing. But anyway, um, but she offered me uh, quite a bit. Well, she offered me four forty-five, and I think we were listed at four and a quarter. And uh, so she said to me, "Don't sell this house to anybody else. I know I have the buyer." Well, uh, as time went on, she kept checking in. Have you have you made a decision yet? Have you made a decision yet? And so. Um, the next day I had to take the, the seller because I was already in contract with a property for her, but it was gonna be contingent on getting this house sold. And she wanted to go over and take some measurements. And then I had to go down to Cottage Grove and drop off some keys uh, to another listing that I had. So after I let the seller into the house that she was purchasing and we did the measurements and everything, locked up and left, I got in my car, and I called up this um, agent and I said, okay, here's what I have. And as long as you have permission from your seller, you can do this. So I said, I have three offers that are all over 500,000. And I said, I have an escalation clause. It will, well, the one that I had at that point in time went up to 515. Now bear in mind that she's offered me 445. <clears throat> and hers was a cash offer. And uh, so I said, um, I had so I have this one offer with an escalation clause. I have <coughs> and I had three of them that were over five hundred thousand. The third one I just didn't have in hand yet. And when I did get it, they had written their escalation clause to go up to five hundred and twenty eight thousand. 
But all three of those were contingent on them selling other pieces of property. And two of those three, they were already in contract and would be closing in two or three weeks. So my conversation with this other agent was, I'm in contract with my seller to purchase another house and we're contingent on her selling this house that you are buying. There is no way that that listing agent, because you have to inform them when you go into contract, when you have a contingency on the sale of a property, I have to tell her or tell that agent what my terms are and everything and that I have this, that I can lift that contingency. And, but they're in a hot market like that, it wasn't going to work to have a contingent on both sides. So I said to this agent, just get me somewhere between 505 and 515 and we can, and we'll write this order or we'll write this business. So I, and I said, you got an hour. And uh, to get a hold of your clients, I'll be back in town in an hour. So I headed down the freeway and within five minutes, she called me back and her buyers had made, they were going to make a cash offer at 516. So she went $1,000 over what I gave her as a top number that I needed. She said, they don't want to take any chances of not getting the property. And we sold it to them. So she wasn't my best offer, but she just kept bugging me and kept in contact and not, but I'm saying that in, in a good way because it wasn't, but she must have sent me 15 text messages. Now, um, just based on my own personality, that would, for some, for some listing agents, that wouldn't fly, but I found her interesting and I felt like we had good rapport and she, I didn't feel like she was um, harassing me at all. And I was in it for the, to get the most that I could for my seller. And so I was thrilled and she turned out to be a really good agent to deal with. And uh, yeah, she, she was wonderful. And as a matter of fact, she even left me flowers um, at my office after we had closed on that property, but it was, it was a really fun exchange. So that building rapport with that listing agent is really important. Um, and I already went through with you about asking if they have offers. Um, and this is one number four on here. It says, why did they fall through if they had one uh, that fell out of contract? So sometimes it, they can fall out of contract because of appraisal and the, the buyer doesn't have enough money to make up the difference so that they can get it financed. Um, it may be that they just got cold feet. It could be that one of them lost their job. It could mean that one of the buyers was stupid and went out and bought a car and now they can't, the lender won't loan it to them. I mean, there's all kinds of things why they will, an offer will, or a property comes back out on the market. <clears throat> so ask those questions. And then we talked earlier about what the seller motivations were. So like, do they need, uh, do they need time to get out? Just any kind of helpful things that can help you get that order or get that that uh, business between the buyer and seller. And you want to have a pre-approval that's undergone. There's a difference between pre-qualification and pre-approval from lenders. And so if you get your buyer <clears throat> where they've already gone through some sort of underwriting, that's that's the best that you can get because let me give you another example of something that happened to me. I had a client who, um, she just found me um, on the internet and I know maybe it was from, she found it from another property that I had sold. And so she just sourced me as the agent. So she came up from Berkeley, California, and she spent four days here looking at houses. And she came with a, a pre-qualification letter from a California bank. And so we, on the about day three, we found a house that she liked. We wrote an offer on it, got it accepted. And so she leaves town and I said, look, you need to, uh, you need to get a second opinion for a loan. She wasn't married to this particular lender. I don't know how she came by them, but I said, well, why don't you just check out Keller Mortgage? Because Keller Mortgage, you don't have closing costs and they give you a thousand dollars back at 
closing that covers the cost of your appraisal. So you'll save about five grand by going through Keller Mortgage and they have competitive rates and blah, blah, blah. I'm not paid anything to represent Keller Mortgage and I always tell everybody that, but just try them out. So the Keller Mortgage, uh, they have their own and I don't know, that I think that they sold out that business and they've retained a portion of it. So I don't know if this is still true, but they did have their own underwriting department in-house at the time. And so within 24 hours, they called back and and they they didn't call me directly because um it's private information between the the lender and the the applicant and, but they told the applicant that they weren't going to be able to give them a loan and, and I think that they told me that they just didn't tell me why and come to find out she owed $180,000 in taxes to the IRS so the IRS had a lien against her and it if it's done outside of the county if you're purchasing a house outside of the county it doesn't immediately show up so it was kind of a weird deal and uh, anyway I I went through several people several lenders here locally and everything because I was already um, we'd already started the I mean we were in contract to buy this house and uh, but she had not, she had started to make a, a monthly payment on this um, IRS debt, but, and she had made one, but she didn't have a written agreement with the IRS. So it had all kinds of little wrinkles in it. So that pre-qualification letter didn't mean anything that she came to me with. And so I learned a valuable lesson about the difference between being pre-qualified and pre-approved. So. I had a little bit of egg on my face and had to say to the um, to the agent who happened to be a Keller Williams agent that I didn't know well, but I said, um, you know, this this is not going to go. And so she she then, you know, of course, they went sold it to somebody else. Um, you know, they have here produce a CMA to uh, on. And I don't actually, I haven't done that. <coughs> I think, excuse me, I think that uh, sometimes when we've, when you've, when you're in a market and you're dealing a lot, let's just say that you're doing dealing a lot in houses that are in that four and a quarter or four fifty range. Um, it's different if you're only showing them one house, but if you've already shown them multiple houses. They're, they're becoming pretty savvy about what a house's value is and what you get for a certain dollar amount. So I don't do it. A lot of agents do, and they come back and they'll do a real quick market analysis on it, but uh, I don't do it. I'm just, I'm not saying that it, that it's good or bad either way, but I, I just haven't done it. And this seller disclosure statement that just, um, some of the agents um, have that posted. I I like to get that, might have my sellers do that before I actually go live on a listing. And then I, my transaction coordinator loads that up so that it's in a, a document attached to the listing. And I never have to worry about, you know, did I get it to them in a timely manner? Okay, so anything, um, that out of this preparing to write an offer that is an aha. Okay, we'll just jump to writing the offer. So you can see that there's a, a number of things that go into writing this offer, price and terms. So that can terms would be how much money are they going to put down for a, an earnest money? And if you're in a tight situation and, and there's multiple offers, then I have them put down 2%. Um, typically, they put down 1%. Uh, seller's disclosure, you don't always get have that in hand. Uh, conveyances, those conveyances, um, those always come up in a preliminary title report. I don't worry too much about those sorts of things in, in the beginning. Um, earnest money, um, that's I already discussed that. 
Um, the inspection period, I oh, unless I know that the inspectors are super busy and backed up and it's going to take me um, 15 business days, which is almost three weeks, um, then I just default to the 10 business days that's on the contract. And then sometimes um, uh, they people say, well, it's, you know, it's a stronger offer if you only set it for five days. I just don't, I haven't found that to be true. And uh, I schedule that inspection. And the minute that I'm in contract, I set the date for the ins or inspection. I get it done right away. And then I, I release that information to the uh, listing agent, particularly if it's a owner occupied house so that those people have plenty of notice that they need to vacate the house during that three hour inspection period. Uh, time for seller acceptance. Now, this is a this is a tricky one. Uh, in March, I sold a house over on uh, near Riverbend Hospital and I had eight offers. Oh, gosh, within like 10 or 12 hours. So I had booked uh, showing appointments for the following days as well. So I didn't want to accept one of those offers right away because I didn't feel like it was fair to those other buyer's agents that had booked appointments for me to pull that out from under them. So when you are talking to that listing agent and you making up this, writing this offer, um, when it's a very active market, I think that it makes the most sense to ask that listing agent, um, how much time do you need to respond? Uh, I have been known to write offers where I only gave them 12 hours to respond. But uh, if if it's a property that's been on the market for a while, um, you know, then I just try to push the envelope. But typically, I will write it for a 24-hour period for them to respond back, say, by the following day at 6 o'clock. But I have found that that um, in the case of this property that I sold near Riverbend Hospital, there was not a single one of those agents that asked me when I was going to review offers. And that's one of the first things that you need to ask, particularly if that listing agent has told you that they already have an offer in hand. Because I would have told them to give me, um, well, this was a, a situation where it was, uh, they had a power of attorney and the person, it was a daughter of the seller and she hadn't informed me that the that Friday night, which I had planned to, review offers then. So I had told a couple of the buyer's agents to um, that we would review by eight o'clock. So to have set their her time for six. No, I, I told them six o'clock, but I said set your expiration time by eight. So it'll give me time to talk to the to the power of attorney. Well she didn't bother to tell me that she had a dinner that night with her husband for a company party and that it was going to go on till 11 o'clock at night and she couldn't, uh, you know, wasn't going to be available to review these offers. Minor detail, actually pretty important one. So what happened was because these agents didn't ask me, a lot of their offers had expired before we had a chance to look over all of the offers and we didn't do it until the next day, Saturday morning, like at nine o'clock. So it's really important to ask the listing agent what kind of time frame they need. If you're in a multiple offer situation, you might as well give them a couple of days to respond because you just don't know what's happening on their end. And you might as you've got to be as compliant and, and overreaching as possible because those people that that their offers expired. I could have gone back to them if any of them had the best offer and said, um, please send me an addendum to change the, the uh, time that we have to review this because we'd like to accept your offer. I could certainly do that. But these other ones, I just let them expire because they weren't the best offers anyway, but they some of them were only giving me 12 hours or 24 hours. And I had still had, I was still showing the property and I wasn't going to to review that early. So 
That's a really important question to ask those listing agents. Financing terms that has to do with, uh, like if it's a contingent pro property, if, if you're selling, you can only buy it if you sell the current home that you're in. And in a competitive market, if that's the case, it's you're better off to find a lender that can give them a bridge loan so that that means that they could purchase their house before theirs is closed and and they have to pay a little bit of money to get that done but if they want the house that's oftentimes what it takes to to get that so that's falls in the terms uh buyer pre-approval letter um any more most of these listing agents you just have to send that pre-approval letter with your offer because the sellers, if they have 10 other offers and you've got cash offers, you've got all of these, you've got to have, you've got to know that these buyers have already been pre-approved and they're on down the pipeline. You just can't take an offer from somebody that just blew into town and wrote an offer, but doesn't have any kind of pre-approval. It's too risky for the sellers. Closing date. Uh, home warranties, I mean, closing date, that's up to you to set what you need. Um, that in, and also um, talking with that listing agent to find out when, uh, if, they're, if they're already out of the house, then the listing agent's going to say, hey, as soon as possible. So then you know that you need to write it for a 30-day close if you're financing it. Home warranties can be paid by a, a buyer's agent. I've often gifted that as a gift there um to my can i can i interrupt you for a question about closing days real quick uh-huh um is that calculated we say a 30-day escrow 21 day escrow whatever it is is that calculated business days or calendar days and does it ex yes. include or exclude holidays uh well so let's first talk about the holidays um if you're gonna if your 30 days is gonna run up and that's business or calendar days um, if those 30 days are going to run up to a like a 4th of July, then I would give my I would write that closing date to be like two days after the 4th of July, after a holiday, because those title companies are going to be slammed and it's and people start taking off for those vacations that work in the underwriting and in all of these other departments. So I would give myself two to three days after a holiday to write my closing date just to be safe. And that okay. closing dates, you generally write them like um, July 7th or sooner. Or, or it says no later than July 7th. So if everything is in line, it can close early. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And um uh, the the cash buyers and such those um, and you know a cash buyer can close before they actually get possession, so maybe the the seller can't get out fast enough, but you can close in the properties there. I mean those kind of things you just work those out with the um, listing agent and and sometimes that goes back and forth. So just just depends on the circumstances for both the buyer and the seller. Uh, the home warranty, um, when uh, when I when I first got into the business, um, it wasn't that, I mean, properties could be on the market for a week or two weeks before they got an offer. And uh, so, but if I got into a competitive um, situation and it didn't have, I mean, in the beginning, seven years ago, we did not have 10 offers on a property. But if I did offer over the uh, asking price, then in my offer, I would ask the seller to pay for the home warranty. Right now, unless I was unless I was paying a gargantuan amount of money over the asking price, I don't even think that I would ask the seller to pay that now, um, because. Uh, what you want is the least complicated offer to get somebody to accept your offer. As a buyer's agent, I have paid for home warranties um, for my clients. I don't do it on all of them. Kind of depends on the property. Like I had one that sold for a million three in Portland and I bought the best home warranty that I could because it was worth it. Made her happy and she actually used it and 
and she it, the costs that were involved were more than what um, it cost me for the home warranty. So that was pretty good. Uh, repair limits. I'm not even sure what that means. Um, I don't because you have a home inspection. I have never written anything for repair limits. Uh, I you don't know what they're going to be until you have a home inspection. So I have no idea what they really mean there. Special clauses, that is like the escalation clause. Uh, addenda, well, addenda that an escalation clause would be a separate addendum. So, um, yep, so that kind of, whoops, got rolled through this thing too fast. But so um, it tells me to look in my participants guide for further explanation, but in as much as I'm lame about following directions, I'm not even sure where it's at. So I'm just going to pretend like I know what I'm talking about. Okay, talk through the offer. Review the contract. Be sure your buyer understands the contract. Review the details like the price, closing date, inspection, contingencies, conveyances. Know what is essential in your area. And that could be, for example, this country property that I was telling you about earlier. That particular property is in a flood zone. And you need to, if, it, if your property is in a flood zone, uh, you need to have army or buyer with the kind of information about how much a, uh, an insurance policy for flood zone if it's a finance property, they will require it. And for that property is anywhere between $1,600 and $2,000 per year to have flood insurance. And that's required by the lender. If they were paying cash, the flood insurance would be up to them whether they carried it or not. Uh, know the standard or common terms for offers in your area. Avoid rookie agent mistakes. Having um, the coaching program, um, Mara or whoever's um, working with you on that, they're going to, um, they're you're not going to have rookie mistakes in your offer. Um, as long as you go back through and and you just read through those contracts and know for sure that you've got what you need, or if if Mara's going to look it over, you'll be fine. Um, I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that part. As long as you do your homework, you'll be fine. Okay, present the offer. Okay. All right, so um, double check all your documents, follow instructions, label it clearly, order the documents, logistically email the summary. Okay, so. Once I have got um, gotten my DocuSign has been done and it comes back to me that's fully signed by my my buyers, then I formulate an, a, an email to the agent and I tell them um, a little bit about the client. Um, there's lots of controversy about telling too much because you don't want to steer a client uh, and to make it appear in the least bit as though a that you're trying to the positive things that you say about somebody. Uh, I mean, I I think I will say things like um, my buyers are a young couple that this is their they're a first time home buyer. They've been so excited because your house has X, Y, and Z things. So you can talk about what they like about the property. Uh, I still give a slight overview in my email to the listing agent about who my clients are. Uh, maybe they're one's a firefighter and one's a teacher or something, you know, I, I may give them a little bit of information in that way. Um, but I repeat, I, I kind of bullet the high points um, of what my contract is going to say so that I make it as easy as possible for that listing agent to, to compare my offer to anybody else's. So I will end my email after I've introduced my buyers and that I'm 
I'm delighted to be able to present this offer on behalf of my buyers. And here's what their offer is. So I'll state um, their names, the purchase price. Uh, if it's a 30 day close, I give them when we would um, anticipate closing. I tell them how much earnest money they're putting down. I tell them how much they will. Uh, so let's just say that they have $100,000 to put down over and above their earnest money. I put that down. Then I put down who their lending institution is. <coughs> I also make a notation that I have included a pre-approval letter. And I, when I put down, uh, maybe I put down Summit Funding and Liddell is the, is the lender. I put down their information in there. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, and then I, and I give them a, the, the time that, um, the offer expires so that they can just look at that quickly and know how soon they need to get back, uh, to me. And, uh, and then, you know, I just tell them, I look forward to doing business with them. I just take it from the, uh, mindset that we're going to do business together that, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But I still, uh, I take the approach that we're going to be working together. Hmm. Is that just, Linda, is that just a, like a one page letter summary of your offer? It's an email. Okay. It's the email to the listing agent. And, Got it. And I, uh, yeah, so I just lay it out in that. Um, and then the contract. Uh, and the pre-approval letter uh, are all attached to my email. Okay. Then, um, I, then I, before I, then I can, I might go ahead and send that, but then I text the agent and or call them or both and tell them that I've sent an offer. Because that, that listing agent, if she's, he or she is getting multiple offers, they're going to be slammed. And so they need to know that that offer is coming so that they can wait for it. Yeah. I just don't email it and have zero communication with them thinking that they're going to get it because they, they, they can be pulling their hair out. I mean, I have uh, like the, the property that I was telling you about earlier from out, the out there by River <coughs> Hospital, I had allotted that whole day afterwards to be in front of the computer. And not a not all agents have that luxury. They're off showing houses and doing other things. But I just blocked it out. I had the time to do it. I blocked it out that I could be right at my computer. So I had my phone beside my laptop. I could answer emails. I could the minute that an offer came through, I printed it off. I took my highlighter and I always highlight who the other agent is. I highlight the price. You know, all of the things that are important, I put them on an Excel spreadsheet. And so I have offer one, offer two, offer three, and I, I print them out because that Excel spreadsheet is what I'm going to either sit down with my, my sellers or I'm going to email it to them. And then if I email it to them and they're, we're going to go over it, then we talk through each one of those offers. And if I do have an escalation course, I have that written in there so that the, the um, sellers can see how much they will escalate to. And it sometimes can be a little bit harder to, for the sellers to understand. So that's why I, I even color code it sometimes. So that Excel spreadsheet, I find extremely helpful. Okay, my question is, um the email summary for the offer. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's, it's more of a, to separate yourself from other people. It doesn't, you don't have to send the offer with, a, with, with an email summary or is it a must? Uh, it, there would, yeah, I wouldn't sell myself first until you, um, you know, without an offer that's not going to do you any good. It's just becomes, because especially if you don't get the offer, you know, if your buyers don't decide to write, I wouldn't spend the time on it. 
and I wouldn't pick up the time of the listing officer offer. No, no my, my question is when you make an offer, uh, you, you're sending the, the email summary goes with the offer, does it? Correct. Yes. So, but can you send just the offer without the summary? Or... Uh, well, I suppose you, yeah, I mean, you could, but, you know, part of your job is to sell yourself and to sell this. Yes. Offer. Okay. So, I don't know why you would just send the offer by itself. Okay. Because the clearer that you can make it and lay it all out says to that <clears throat> listing agent on the other end, they're looking for people that are organized okay. and efficient and clear uh -huh. communications for the person that they want to deal with. And it does make a difference. Okay. You may get some juicy, you know, um, Attach, you'll find my offer and just the name. And sometimes it's the best offer. So then, you know, that you, you look at it, you go, geez, I wonder why they didn't give me, you know, a you know, sales data to go with this. And so then I call them up and talk to them and just find out if I, you know. Okay. Get a little bit more information. But yeah, uh, it, mo most agents do not send it with just an offer and nothing else. Okay. You know what the, the L sign on your forehead looks like? That loser? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be that. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Give them the, the most tools that they, they can. So, okay. So our next thing is receive and respond or receive and review the offer checklist. So make sure the offer is complete. And, oh, and so once this listing offer... Uh, listing agent gets the offer, they will reply back and they'll say received. And sometimes um, I'll even put it in my email, please confirm receipt. So really important. And, and I do that, lots of times you'll get a text and the uh, buyer's agent will say, I sent the offer, can you confirm that you received it? And sometimes I had one that went to junk mail. I was shocked. So, um, yeah, really important to kind of double check on your end and then um, and then have that agent. Um, I wouldn't have known if they had a text with me. I wouldn't have known I had the offer. So really important to do that. Uh, get offered to the seller in a timely manner. And if I I don't play any games with getting that offer submitted, I don't try to be the first. I don't want to be the last either. I just get it sent off so that I know that I'm in line. If there's lots of offers, it's, you know, you know, the tendency can be to, um, to uh, wait till the end to see how many and then see if you can weasel out of that listing off uh, agent what the amount was. But that can be kind of dangerous because they might get an offer that they like really well and just take it before that deadline. There's nothing that even if they can set a deadline, but they can take an offer beforehand if they want. So I just get my offer in. And here it says create executive summary. That's what we were talking about in the email. Oh, this is oh, this must be on the listing agent. Never mind. I don't know what this created an executive summary means. Let's see if I can find it in my notes here. Uh, it doesn't say. Okay. Um, Call the buyer's agent, call the lender if allowed in your area to verify the pre-approval. I think that's a really good idea. I don't do that, but um, if I know the lender, um, and I mean, oftentimes I'm reviewing these offers and deciding which one to accept and it's eight o'clock at night. So if during that day that uh, all of these offers are coming in, like if it's a really hot property and I'm getting a lot of activity, um, I can, you have to call before the five o'clock hour. It doesn't mean that you're going to get through to them either. So it's a little bit 
Sometimes email is faster just to email them and tell them that you've received an offer by such and such person. And I've had lenders that will call once they know that a buyer is submitting and they'll call and just say, hey, I just want you to know that I have pre-approved this buyer and they're highly qualified. Hope they get the business, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, that one is sometimes a little bit harder. Important thing to do, but sometimes a little bit harder to do depending on the time of day that you're uh, reviewing offers. And then create an outline document to reference when you call the sellers. And that's what I was talking about, that Excel spreadsheet that I do. And if any of you want it, just send me an email and I can send you a sample one of, that I have and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But um, I, I found it really helpful and and uh, so so do the, the sellers. It's, it's, it's a good tool to have. Okay, so let's see where we're at. Create an offer in command. And this is where I say to you, you're on your own when it comes to command from me. Um, Angela does all of this for me. So um, that just, I can't help you on that one. I have enough trouble without getting into command. I kind of like it. I go in there and I've entered my database in there and everything. but. Um, you know, you can just get so bogged down in it and it doesn't, I just feel like it doesn't pay me to spend my time there. Okay, so review, receive review, respond to the offer. And this says reach a decision. So sometimes the, the offer is uh, really obvious. I mean, the one that you want to accept. And sometimes you have to kind of think about it. It might depend on the lending. It might depend on uh, how much time they need to get in. It might, if it, it's a contingency, it's still a really good price, but the contingency makes you nervous. Uh, so there's, you know, sometimes it isn't as clear cut as you would think. I would say 80% of the time it's pretty clear cut. Respond to the offer. Um, and so um, I, I wait until my, uh, my seller has signed the document and then I call that buyer's agent. Sometimes they'll call me uh, before I'm ready and they'll say, have you made a decision yet? Because they're all excited and nervous and, they're, and I try to get back to them as soon as I possibly can. Now, I, let, me, let me go back to something else. Uh, so here when you... Um, respond to the offer, say say you have accepted the offer. Uh, a couple of things that I do and don't do. One is that I do not automatically go in once my seller has signed the papers. I don't go in and click that listing to be pending, even though I am pending, until I have called every single agent that submitted an offer. I don't send them a text message. I, I call them. And if it's eight o'clock at night, I call them. It can go to voicemail, um, but at least I've made the effort to call them. And, and oftentimes what's really interesting about doing that is the feedback that you get from these buyer's agents. And sometimes they'll say, yes, I didn't think that we would win in this case, but this is a first time home buyer. They hadn't made an offer before. And I, I ju we just needed to go through the process so that they could see where they were at and so that they would understand it. And they were serious. They wanted the house if they could get it. But, you know, the agent knew that they weren't going to, that they hadn't offered enough. But um, their your task is if you have an offer to write and that your client has asked you to write it, you write it. But um so anyway, but I, I'm, I'm really a stickler about that. I don't want an agent who has taken the time to show the property, to get their offer submitted to me, to write the offer and everything, and then to have them find out that somebody else bought it and they only find out because they get the message of pending from the RMLS. That's my job to make that personal contact. And if it's, if it's 10 o'clock at night that we've accepted it, I might... Um, send an email and say, 
and instead of calling them or texting them. I don't really like to text late it, after eight o'clock is kind of my line that I draw. There are people that like to go to bed at 8.30. There are people that are up till one in the morning and I don't know who those people are. So if it does, if it is something where I've done it later at night, then I will send an email and I personalize it to each of the agents and say, um, because we reviewed this late, I didn't want to call or text you um, late in the evening, but thank you so much for submitting this offer. We did go with a different offer and and explain a little bit as best as I, you know, what I feel will help them. And, uh, but I'm always very gracious that they submitted, took the time to submit an offer. And, and one of the reasons I do this is I've been in sales for virtually my um, all of my adult life, you know, 30 years as a wholesale lumber broker, that's sales. I started out at 16 working in a drugstore, um, clerking at a counter. I worked in the music department. And so I have just, I've been in sales the whole time. There are good times. There are bad times in sales. And in real estate, you want to know, you want those agents, when you get into a tough spot, and things are tough and you're trying to get a, some business done, the people that you have treated kindly and they remember you favorably are the ones that will help you in the long run. But if you are a jerk about it and they found out that the, you know that you just click off of these things and going pending without respect for them and their buyer, because sometimes their buyer will see that it's pending before they've ever had, the agents had notification and that's not right either. So, um, I, I'm very careful about um, my communication with those uh, buyers, agents, and buyers when it comes to the uh, when I've accepted an offer. Okay, so um, so it's asking me how has your thinking changed? What ideas or mindsets were new? So would anybody? like to offer something that you might have learned today that you didn't know already? Uh, just how many details that you don't think of, um, how many details there are that you don't think of. Uh, so I guess that's more of a big picture thing, but, but it still yep. kind of applies to this too. It does. And and the one thing that I would say to you, all of you, is that any time that you take these trainings, and that's why I continue to take trainings all the time. Let me give you another example that, that um, Darren Ricketts um, in our office in Eugene uh, gave a presentation. It was just called Eat with the Elite. And so you, um, we have lunch together and it's an informal group. And he'll that whoever the speaker is they'll talk and at this particular time it was he's big on negotiations but he's also a finance guy and so he gives you numbers and so I find that if I can come away from any training that I have taken and I have one new little nugget because my pea brain can't hold an hour's worth of information but I can sure take I can sure hold one and he gave me one that I thought was genius the other day. And he was talking about people are, are complaining about interest rates. And, oh, well, now interest rates are at 7%. You know, that's a real big uh, area of concern. And why think, and, and buyers will use it on you too. And I did an open house for another agent yesterday. And so they tried this on me too yesterday. And so I came back with, with this little nugget from Darren. Um, and this has to do with, when you're talking about the payment that a person's going to have, a and this property that I was showing was had a property tax of twenty eight hundred dollars per year, and it was on 79th Street out of Springfield, and so it wasn't in the city; it was on one acre, and it was only twenty eight hundred dollars uh, per year for that. So let's just say that not it wasn't 28, but it was 24 because 2400 because it's easier for my pea brain to do the math. So that's $200 a month that the property tax is going to add to your monthly payment. If you had that same house and it was on just a half acre city lot in River Road area 
and it was um, a value of five and a quarter, you'd probably have between five thousand and fifty five hundred dollars. Let's just say six six thousand for round terms. Uh, and look at the difference of what it's going to mean to a a monthly payment. More than double. So the property taxes has a bigger impact on your on your monthly payment right now than the difference in the the rise in the interest rates. Now that's not true if if you're talking about three percent interest rates versus six and three quarter, but um, it was mind boggling really when you thought of when you think about it how you know, you can go from four or $500 a month just in your property taxes versus 200, just depending on what property you've chosen. So, um, but you're not gonna learn it all in a day and that's why you have a team around you. So don't feel like you have to know everything. But if you can pick up, you know, three to five really good little tips that you learned today, that's a lot. And, um, but again, you've got coaches in the PC coaching program that can help you with a lot of these things. So, and all you have to do is just have your own experiences. And once you have a few, then you'll, you learn from every experience that you have. And that's the beauty part about it. You just keep getting better. So this says, how do you feel differently? What was meaningful to you today? How will your behaviors be different going forward? And what actions will you take? I lumped two of them together. You can say anything you like. It doesn't matter to me. I think what I've also learned is just to, to make sure that you, whatever you do, you cross your T's and dot your I's. Uh, that is quite important to avoid redoing and make sure that uh, you you are on the same page as well with the either your buyer or your seller, and know your your know your numbers and show that you are you are the fundi on the subject. Yeah, and and you know that's one of the reasons why from day one I, uh, in addition to just knowing your numbers and just I that's why I've always had a transaction coordinator because there was so much to learn in this business that I did not want the responsibility because if you make a mistake, I mean, these can be really big mistakes that you can yeah. make on writing an offer. You're mm -hmm. talking, we're talking about not just pocket chain, we're talking about big things that we can make as a problem. So uh, yeah, yeah, that I, I really like. And you know, for it costs $350 per transaction to have a transaction coordinator. So it's like, to me, it is a no-brainer. And they can also, you know, they can, because they do it so often, they can just make you a better agent by the way that they handle, you know, and point things out to you as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting job to have. I I absolutely love it. And I encourage all of you just to, to um, embrace it and, now that you have decided that you want a career path as an agent, you meet wonderful people. And I'll tell you the other thing that's really, and this is kind of one of those funny little stories, but um, I love to have dinner parties and I don't necessarily like to go to dinner parties, but I like to have my own. Uh, but you can be the best storyteller because you don't tell who the people are and you have to be kind of careful about how you repeat things. But you can tell some of the funniest stories and they'll at, and the people that I'm around and I have, I call it my orphans Christmas Eve uh, dinner. And I've done it for 30 some years and I invite single people and just people that don't have any family around and that sort of thing. And so they'll, they'll, uh, they'll want to know, well, what's the, what's the latest goofy thing that happened? And so, I mean, you become kind of the, uh, you'll just find funny things to tell to people that uh, people just scratch their head and, and uh, you know, it's kind of like people do the darndest things. 
I'll tell you one and then we're about out of time anyway, but I'll tell you one funny story. Um, I didn't know this guy very well. Uh, and one of my neighbors had referred him to me. And the guy only lives down the street from me, a couple houses. But he was, and he had owned a lot of properties. He'd had rental properties at one time, but he was extremely quirky. So we, I, I had to, it took about six months to get his property, uh, get his property going. And he was, he's one of those guys that he was not particularly motivated. I think he, in reality, uh, when I viewed the property, there was this big bowl outside one of the, the houses and it had a lot of roach clips there. So I thought, well, that explains why he's kind of unmotivated. He's just did too much pot smoking. So anyway, I said, you got to keep this lawn mowed. And, and I said, you got to, it's got to look good. So he just had some bark done and he was renting out the house and the the renters actually spread the bark. He I don't know how he convinced them to do it, but they spread the bark for him. And he goes out and he mows the lawn and he dumps these grass clippings on this newly underneath a rhododendron, but on this newly spread bark. And so I go over there um, and I was getting ready to stage it, I think. And I I said, I noticed this pile of grass clippings and I go, you can't be doing that. And he did not have garbage service. And he had always taken his garbage to his church. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that this is the epitome of cheap. So I said, okay, look, I, I have every other week, they come and take my yard debris can, the garbage service. So go ahead, just scoop this up. You can put it in my garbage can. So um, I ended up selling his property and then we bought him a smaller place because this had had a, another rental on it. So uh, bought him a smaller place. And after it was over, he would still drive across town from his new house and drop his lawn debris in my can. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Who does that sort of thing? So it's like... <laughs> You can't make some of this stuff up. It was kind of funny, but in the other, you know, it was annoying at the time. So finally I told him, no more, buddy. <laughs> You've had all the good graces. And he goes, well, I just didn't think it mattered. Well, it matters to me. And it, you know, <laughs> uh, he was like lame. But anyway, <laughs> it's a funny business, but, you know, it's fun and it's highly rewarding. And people can make massive amounts of money if you, if you want to, you can make a really good living if you want to. And, uh, you know, it's, you gotta, you gotta love dealing with people though. That's, you don't have to be an extrovert to do it, but you got, you, uh, you do have to enjoy the process somewhere along the way. So before we sign off, are, is there anything else? I guess I should make sure that, oh, this is just your tracking system here that's left. Do not call list, blah, blah, blah. Role playing, we're not going to do that. Uh, so before we um, before we sign off, is there any last thing that you'd like to ask? Okay, well, I gave you my email. I'll give you my phone number. Um, if you have any questions or something comes up, give me a holler, text me. Um, either one, 541-953-3011. So thanks so much for listening in today and I wish you great success. Thank Stop. you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.